My name is Sultan Saud Al Qasmi. I'm a uh, UAE based writer. Thank you to uh, uh, Emirates Policy Center for inviting me to moderate the session, and thank you do to Dr. Sam Al, -Al Kitbi. We are discussing uh, today, I think, one of the most uh, relevant uh, foreign policy issues for us here in the Gulf. The session will be in English. However, Mr. Abdurrahman Al Rashid will be speaking in Arabic. The Jalsa Bilogha Al Ingliziya, Walakin Al Stad Abdurrahman Al Rashid, Sayyid Haddath Bilogha Al Arabiya. Um, I will ask you to please keep your uh, interventions to under 15 seconds. I will cut you off if you take too long. رجاءً يعني مداخلاتكم تكون أقل من 15 ثانية لأن نريد نسمع من أكبر عدد ممكن من الأشخاص. So لو سمحتوا أستاذ عبد الله بشارة أستاذ عبد الله بشارة شكرا نعم ممكن نبدأ طيب. So uh, we're talking about U.S. foreign policy and the Gulf this morning. Many people regard the U.S. foreign policy as being inconsistent. Uh, towards conflict in the region. Now, there are signals that are sent to us here in the Gulf uh, that might not be exactly uh, the same, either from the, the State Department, the uh, White House, the uh, Defense Department, but uh, in the end, this is seen as a single administration. This, of course, applies to U.S. foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Iran, vis-a-vis -vis Syria, vis-a-vis -vis other issues in the region, and most recently vis-a-vis -vis the Gulf crisis uh, that started earlier this summer. So uh, my first question, I'd like to jump in immediately into the, into the panel. My first question to uh, our, uh, our panelists, by the way, we have assembled for you a, a, a fantastic uh, a lineup of uh, panelists. I begin with uh, the gentleman uh, to my immediate uh, left, uh, uh, Ed Rogers, who is an expert in political, political campaigns and former deputy assistant to the president and executive assistant uh, to the chief of staff of the White House and a well-read Republican uh, columnist, uh, if, I, if I may say Republican, but a columnist at the Washington Post. And then in the middle we have uh, James Lindsay, who is a senior vice president uh, at the Council of Foreign Relations. And then last but not least, we have Abdurrahman Al Rashid, who is one of the most respected uh, columnists in the Arab world. And in fact, uh, Abdul Khariq Abdullah uh, calls him, I think, one of the most influential, if not the most influential uh, columnist uh, in our region. So uh, we have a star lineup uh, for you. Thank you all for joining us. My first question is Is there really a foreign policy inconsistency? Uh, in the, in the, to, uh, from the U.S. government? Uh, or is it the fact that this is how the U.S. works? So is there a foreign policy consistency uh, towards major issues in the, uh, uh, to, uh, in the Middle East? Do different departments in the U.S. have a different policy towards major conflicts and, uh, and uh, matters in the Middle East? I'd like to hear from you first, uh, Ed. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Is there inconsistency? Well. Some of the institutional, some of the inconsistency, I would say, is baked into our system. We have been through a presidential transition from presidents who are wildly different from policy perspective, but also from a stylistic point of view. I think that that discount from my Republican biases, but the Obama years, especially the last term, there was drift at best in the Middle East and an erosion, at worst, of some of our core anchor relationships and historic relationships in the region. But in Trump, you have a different president with a different set of priorities. And in Trump, you have a stylistic change, and I mean that gently. But you have a lot of noise and confusion that comes from this White House every single day that distracts from, adds to, takes away from whatever the policy objectives might be. That said, if you can look through the fog and listen through all the shouting, you do see the structure of a policy of a strategy. Number one is a more aggressive eradication of ISIS. Number two is to restore our historical relationship with our core allies in Saudi Arabia, here in the Gulf, in Egypt, it includes Israel. 
third is to have a common front against Iran's aggression in the region, questioning of the continuity and the wisdom of the nuclear agreement can be a panel in and of itself, to reorganize, to re-energize rather our economic relationship is a priority of Trump everywhere and it's certainly been a priority of the administration here. And then recently you have the news of a, a concrete proposal that's in the works for what President Trump calls the ultimate deal, a peace agreement between Israel and Palestine that is, that is forthcoming. I don't know if many people saw that piece just in the last 48 hours, but it was written by Peter Baker at the New York Times, who is not considered adversarial with the White House for the New York Times. I would say that piece was collaboratively written. It quoted Dennis Ross, who I think a lot of people in this room know as saying something positive about it. Dennis Ross didn't have to do that. I would consider that piece to be authoritative and timed when it was for a reason. So my point is, those five components are a policy. You can disagree with how any of them are going or why there's more of this and less of that, but yes, there is a strategy, there is a policy, it is a shift from the previous administration. Trump, again, adds a lot of confusion daily, sometimes more than once a day, that tends to distort and tends to feed the critics that want to criticize, but, but yes, there is the foundation and the infrastructure of a coherent policy in the Middle East. James, um, we don't see that here in the Gulf. We see that, you know, uh, that State Department says something and White House says something else. We see that, uh, for example, with Qatar over the past five, six months, that uh, Trump sends us messages that he is in accord, in, in accord with uh, the Saudi policy or the UAE policy, and then, someone, then Tillerson comes and uh, he shatters. Uh, he shatters that with uh, a statement. And uh, we've seen him come several times to the, to the Middle East, and we, we're fra frankly, we're confused. We don't know who speaks for the U.S. What is the U.S. foreign policy? Or is this our perception and things are crystal clear in America? Uh, uh, you ask a great question uh, that's complex. Before I answer it, I, I do want to say it's a great honor to be here, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Sam for having me. And I know how hard she and her team uh, work to put on such a great conference, and so I just want to recognize uh, that hard work. Uh, I think there's actually a lot of truth in both your question and in, in Ed's response. I, I do think as you look at any administration, uh, there is always the tendency or the temptation for different parts of an administration to say different things on the same topic. That is just built into the nature of having a very large government, indeed, you look at the White House, the National Security Advisor, his or her major challenge is to try to make all of those parts of an administration work together. Having said that, uh, I think that we look at the Trump administration, the degree of dissonance or lack of clarity or disparate views is higher than normal. Uh, and as you look out on it, I think one of the questions always is, who speaks for the president uh, on foreign policy? And in your question, you alluded, I think, the one issue that probably jumps out at a lot of people in this room, uh, the issue of Qatar. If we go back to the summer uh, with the announcement of the embargo, President Trump very quickly went on Twitter and gave the embargo against Qatar uh, his full-throated backing. Uh, in the Rose Garden, he announced that, uh, from his perspective, Qatar was a very a uh, major figure in funding of terrorism. Uh, and less than a week later, Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis signed a deal to sell $12 billion worth of F-15s to Qatar. Normally, you would not see, in most administrations, President one condemning a country, and then within a week, seeing the Secretary of Defense conduct a major arms deal. And I think that is, this is an administration that is different than others uh, in terms of the looseness of how it operates. I think that the challenges the administration faced ramping up early on and getting a full set of advisors uh, has been well documented. But I think there's a more fundamental uh, challenge uh, in American foreign policy. And I think we can sort of talk a little bit more about the strategy that 
that Ed laid out. But I would note, I think people trying to understand American foreign policy, whether you are in the United States or you are outside of the United States, let's say here in the Gulf, is the question of whether or not American foreign policy is uh, what I might call Twitter Trump or teleprompter Trump. And clearly the president uh, has used uh, Twitter, used social media. He's a big fan of it. Uh, he sees it as the single tool which made it possible for him to become president of the United States to break through the mainstream. Uh, and he often tweets uh, his raw opinion, raw reaction to events. Uh, indeed, one of the things interesting, just uh, yesterday, General John Kelly, Chief of Staff, gave a briefing in which he talked about how tweets are what they are. Uh, he doesn't focus on tweets. He focuses on good staff work, a more traditional approach, which is where we get teleprompter Trump. That is one in which uh, when the president gives speeches in front of a teleprompter, it's been worked through the standard interagency process, and you have an agreed upon uh, set of points the president's going to make. He usually, though not always, uh, will follow what is there. And I think one of the big questions is always uh, to what extent the president's tweets uh, really represent the policy he's going to follow through on. Yes, uh, I want to give you a chance to wear your headset because Mr. Abdelrahman will be speaking in, in Arabic. Mr. Abdelrahman, هل حقا توجد تناقضات في السياسة الخارجية الأمريكية تجاه الخليج أم نحن في الخليج لا نفهم كيف آلية إدارة الحكومة الأمريكية؟ طبعا في البداية أشكر المركز الإمارات للسياسة وأشكر الدكتور وحيها طبعا الدكتورة ابتسام على أشياء كثيرة من بينها طبعا دعوة للمشاركة وأشكر الفريق العامل معهم في إعداد هذا المؤتمر لأكثر أعتقد أكثر المؤتمرات نجاحا أعتبرني أنا من المداومين على الحضور يعني على المؤتمراتكم وملتقياتكم بالنسبة لموضوع الولايات المتحدة الحقيقة هي مش خلاف في الشخصيات صحيح إنه ترامب مختلف عن أوباما وأوباما مختلف عن جورج دبليو بس اللي حصل فيه تغييرات في العالم كثيرة جدا السياسة الأمريكية قامت على ثلاث قامت على الجيوبراتيكال الجغرافيا السياسية قامت على البترول وقامت على حماية إسرائيل هذه الثلاث كانت أساسية في تقريبا خمسين سنة في طريقة رسم السياسة الخارجية بشكل خطوطها العريضة بعدين اللي طرأ على الموضوع طبعا كنا نعرف أنه في ثلاثة طرأت واحدة فيهم اللي هي البترول تغير صار فيه البترول شيل أويل which is change things so Middle East oil is now less important, أقل أهمية. الشيء الثاني الإرهاب أصبح عامل مهم جدا في حسم السياسة الخارجية. الشيء الثالث الحقيقة اللي هو حدث جديد جدا ونعتقد حيكون له تأثيرات خلال السنة هذه والسنوات القليلة المقبلة. الاتفاق النووي مع إيران اللي هو غير أو أضاف معطيات جديدة ما كانت موجودة. بالنسبة للولايات المتحدة اليوم ما عاد صارت مضطرة زي ما كان أيام التقسيمات الحرب الباردة معسكرين المنطقة كانت مقسمة بين دول مثل الخليج والأردن والمغرب هذه الدول كلها محسوبة في صف المعسكر الغربي دول زي اليمن الجنوبي سوريا العراق فترة من الزمن كانت الصومال إلى آخره محسوبة على المعسكر السوفيتي الجزائر إلى آخره هذه كلها تغيرت الآن ما هي موجودة هالتقسيمات وبالتالي أصبحت المنطقة متحركة جدا إلى درجة اليوم إنه الولايات المتحدة تقف مع السعودية والأمارات والبحرين ومصر ولا تقف مع قطر إلى هالدرجة من التغيرات الكثيرة في طريقة النظر أو المشهد السياسي في المنطقة فالمنطقة تغيرت المبادئ العامة اللي قامت عليها الولايات المتحدة والدكتور الأساسية اللي قامت عليها تغيرت وبالتالي احنا نشوف منطق مختلف جدا انه السعودية ايضا ترحب بالرئيس ترامب وتستقبله وتوقع معه صفقة سلاح وبعدين تروح الاتحاد لروسيا وتوقع اتفاق اخر في الاس 400 الاعتبارات نفس الاعتبارات تقريبا انه في الولايات المتحدة ممكن انه الصفقات العسكرية السعودية ما لا لا تمرر أو إذا مرت قد لا لا ترسل وإذا أرسلت قد لا تعطى الذخيرة زي ما حصل في وقت أوباما فهذه التغييرات الحقيقة اضطرت كل الأطراف المعنية سواء الولايات المتحدة من جانب أو دول المنطقة من جانب آخر إلى النظر بطريقة مختلفة جدا في هذا الموضوع 
يعني الموضوع فيه تشعبات عديدة لكن من الواضح جدا أنه العامل الأساسي في التغيرات الإقليمية الحالية يكاد يكون العامل الرئيسي اللي هو السياسة الإيرانية اللي تقوم على أساسها السياسات الأخرى اللي معظمها ردود فعل ونشاطات مضادة لها ومن هذا الأساس أنا أعتقد إحنا ممكن نحكم على السياسة الأمريكية من هذا الجزئية تحديدا لأن هذه مسألة أساسية الخلافات مع الولايات المتحدة في قصة التعامل معها في اليمن أو الخلاف معها في قصة قطر أو الخلاف معها حتى في التعامل في سوريا أنا أعتقد هذه مؤقتة ومع الوقت تتغير لاحقا الخلاف في موضوع العلاقة الأمريكية مع إيران علاقة أساسية ممكن تسوي شفت حقيقي تماما في العلاقات العربية بما فيها العلاقات العربية القريبة جدا من الولايات المتحدة ما فيها السعودية والعمارات والبحرين باتجاهات مختلفة لو استمرت السياسة الأوبامية القديمة الثمان سنوات اللي راحت وكان فيها لكن ترامب الحسن الحظ يعني أنه أوقف السياسة أوباما اللي كانت قائمة على فتح الباب للعلاقة مع إيران وتغيير العلاقة اللي أصبحت كانت علاقة معادية جدا ومن ذاك اليوم إلى اليوم إحنا الآن ترامب اللي عمله في التسعة شهور اللي راحت وعشرة شهور اللي راحت الحقيقة يعني سياسة ممكن نعطي نعطيها نقيمها في الحرب على رهاب في سوريا إلى حد كبير يعني ناجحة على الأقل في المنطلقات اللي هو وضعها لنفسه ولا إدارته وكذلك في العراق العلاقة مع ترامب في التعامل مع إيران حتى الآن ما في نجاح كافي ولكن على الأقل السياسة سياسة ترامب أوضح من سياسة أوباما في التعامل مع إيران هو واضح من جهة وغير واضح من جهة ثانية واضح في 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 إيران وغير واضح في وغير في واضح في في نعم اعتبرها نعم اقل يعني اهميه نعم نعم سو اد مستر عبد الرحمن الراشد منشن ذات ذا يو اس فورن بوليسي تورز ذا ريجن ات ليست واز بيست اوريجينالي اور هيستوريكلي اون ثري فاكتورز جيو بوليتكس اويل اند ان اسرائيل سكيورتي اوف اسرائيل بت ناو ذير ار نيو فاكتورز ذات هاف كم ان تو بلاي اسبيشلي كاونتر تيرورزم So uh, my, my question to you is, uh, what are the exact U.S. strategic goals in this region, in the, in the long term, according to, what, to how you read them? And how can the U.S. best achieve these goals? Well, certainly under Trump, there's something to his America first agenda. Mm -hmm. And so the geopolitical circumstances, the threats that can emanate from here, the instability, the erosion of order, Restoring that is instinctively a Trump priority, and it's in furtherance of America's own defense that that instability around the world does not serve any U.S. purpose. And our problems didn't start on January 21st when Trump was elected, so he's been dealt a lot of cards that are fast situations that are that are fast moving and have to be somewhat adapted on the fly. And it gets back to what you said earlier about some of the inconsistencies. And I'll say that one more, t one more time in a different way about the inconsistencies. The Trump tweets are something I think that will be a historical phenomenon. But the, the inconsistency is also present in American health care policy. It's also consistent and persistent in American tax policy that is right now being formulated in the Congress. So the notion that Trump sends in an inconsistent message, discipline is not their specialty. The notion that Trump sends in an inconsistent or erratic uh, message via a tweet or sometimes something else permeates the administration. And in many cases, there's really no effort to reconcile those morning tweets with today's policy initiatives. And you'll see it at the White House. You certainly see it in Congress where they're just sort of greeted with a shrug and, and move on. I know that's, that's not what foreign capitals are used to when they listen to America, but I think it's, I think it's here to stay. Uh, I don't want to deviate too much from your question, but Again, I think some of the tweeting and some of the errant comments are best 
don't think about them for about 48 hours. And many of them will just disappear into the ether and don't really affect U.S. policy. Our strategic objectives are, are the same. There's nothing that's changed about that. The actors, the emphasis, the priorities, the role of Russia, the, what is the, the transition of an orientation toward, away from the Obama orientation toward Iran, toward the Trump orientation, all of that is new and it's happening on a real-time basis. I want to ask you, uh, what are the strategic goals? Because you said, uh, is it anti-Obama uh, policy? What, what is the strategic goal of the U.S. in the Middle East? If you can name one, two, three, or two. Uh, suppression of ISIS and terrorism, restoration of order, strengthening of American allies. Hey, and that's just the Ed Rogers point of view. That's not mm -hmm. from of course, of course. the do Trump you, Do you agree, uh, James, that these are the U.S. Uh, foreign policy strategic objectives in the Middle East, uh, uh, defeating ISIS, uh, uh, stabilizing the region, restoring order? Do you agree that these are the strategic goals, or are there others? Oh, there are certainly others. I mean, one is the free flow of oil. Uh, I, I take uh, the point about the rise of hydraulic fracking, which is made the United States, uh, one of the world's largest oil producers. It has sort of changed the energy equation within the United States. Uh, but I think it's important to keep in mind that oil is traded on a global basis. And obviously, we heard at yesterday's panel uh, the importance of oil to the global economy. And I think that remains a strategic purpose uh, in the United States. If I may, I want to just go back to this question about tweets. Uh, I, I take its point, and I think it is true that most of the time, uh, many people in the administration on Capitol Hill sort of want to put a tweet aside and sort of see how things develop. But in international relations and foreign policy, uh, tweets have their own lives uh, because they're read uh, or understood or interpreted by people who, who come across them. And so when the president tweets out that he's behind uh, the recent moves in Saudi Arabia, or he tweets his feelings about the leader of North Korea, uh, those have potentials to affect how other he will behave, and so they're consequential, uh, even if people in the White House choose to put him aside uh, for a moment or two. One other thing is I am not so sure that this administration has a strategy in pursuit of those geopolitical uh, objectives that we've been discussing. I, I take Ed's point, I think certainly the rhetoric of this administration has changed greatly vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Obama administration, and that's not insignificant. Again, my sense is people here in the Gulf wanted to hear a full-throated uh, American uh, response, and I think they've heard that in the first several months uh, of the Trump administration. Having said that, I'm not so sure on the substance that American foreign policy has changed that much. Uh, I will note on Qatar, it is not the case that the administration uh, has adopted the position of uh, Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates. I would note that the United States stood by while, while Kirk Hook fell. Uh, I will note that, uh, as best I can tell, while the military may have been freed up to do a bit more uh, in places like uh, Syria and Afghanistan, uh, the president hasn't thrown out uh, the policy that preceded it. And finally, on the question of Iran, what is very interesting, this is a president who threatened to rip up uh, the Iran nuclear deal on day one. Mm -hmm. And despite what happened on October 13th, this president has not torn up mm -hmm. uh, the Iran nuclear deal. Now, it may be the case that we will see a, a more well thought out, developed strategy emerging in, in the months and weeks to come. But I'm not so sure at this point that the actual practice of the policy has changed all that much, even if the tone has changed tremendously. Thank you. Sadat Abdurrahman, uh, I will be asking in Arabic now. Sadat Abdurrahman, uh, I mean, uh, I have to ask the question even before I ask you about the goals of strategy for America, but how do we in the Middle East to affect the goals of these goals? We have, of course, what we call the petrol weapon, which is the one that قد أسيء استخدامه ممكن وأيضا لا ليس له تأثير كما كان مثل ما تفضلت فكيف لنا أن نؤثر على هذه السياسات أو الأهداف الاستراتيجية؟ يعني زي ما شرحت أنا طبعا اللي هي الـ 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 الأهداف الرئيسية المتحدة الواضحة ما تغيرت ولكن 
الظروف المحيطه فيها تغيرت وظروف المنطقه طبعا تغيرت اليوم بالنسبه لدول المنطقه عندها يعني اذا حصلت القضايا الرئيسيه لو افترضنا الواحد لو قال انه حدد قضيه رئيسيه واحده فقط على اساس انت يكون عندك تركيز فوكس عليها وتقنع صانع السياسه الامريكيه انه يقف معك في هذه الموضوع فبدل ما يكون عندك سله من عشرة قضايا ولا عشر موضوعات يكون عندك قضيه واحده رئيسيه تركز عليها انا اعتقد القضيه المشتركه بمعظم القضايا في المنطقه اللي هو التهديد الايراني صحيح انه قديم جدا التهديد الايراني من من عام 79 وحتى هذا اليوم بس هذا القاسم مشترك اللي يجمع بين القضايا المختلفه على الرغم طبعا انه انا ما قل من اهميه القضايا الاخرى يعني النزاع في اليمن معظم معظم النزاع داخلي يمن يمني حتى وان دخلت في دول اخرى زي السعوديه وال وإيران من جهة ثانية النزاع في سوريا أيضا نزاع داخلي مهما أيضا وصفناه ودخلت فيه آيسس وروسيا وأمريكا وكل الدول الثانية التركيز على قضية واحدة رد على سؤالك شيخ سلطان إنه القضية الواحدة اللي هي إيران أنا أعتقد المشكلة الرئيسية إنه في فترة يعني في فترة كانت مبشرة جدا إنه إيران مستعدة مقابل الضمانات الكافية أن تتخلى عن مشروعها العسكري في الجانب النووي وعلى الأساس أنه إذا تذكر بعد ما صارت قبل التو قبل التوقيع كان معظم الكلام اللي صادر عن إيران أنه الشركات الإيرانية بتشتغل في المنطقة السياحة الإيرانية تستقبل السواحل الخليجيين العلاقات يعني حتتحسن هذا كان المفهوم العام أو المنظور العام أنه في حال وجود اتفاق ورفع العقوبات اللي صار انه من يوم من يوم تم التوقيع الحقيقه راينا وجه اخر للسياسه الخارجيه الايرانيه طبعا مع غياب اختفاء راف سنجاني واختفاء المجاميع المعتدله الاخرى حتى روحاني نفسه بعد ما هندس الاتفاقيه رجع الى الوراء وتاخر اللي اكتشفنا الان مو شركات السياحيه ولا ولا السجاد ولا الكافيار اللي معظمهم الحرس الثوري اللي دخلوا على المنطقه قصة مثلا لواء الفاطميون عصائب الحق يعني اكتشفنا كمية هائلة من النشاطات الميليشاوية العسكرية الضخمة منتشرة بعد خلال خلال المفاوضات وبعد توقيع الاتفاق في سوريا وفي العراق وطبعا موجودة سابقا في لبنان ووصلت لحد وجود منطقة اليمن وتتمدد طبعا ف أنا أعتقد المشكلة الرئيسية اليوم إذا ما يكون في في السياسة الخارجية الأمريكية اللي هو موضوع الموضوع اليوم رد على الموضوع الرئيسي إنه يكون في نوع من وجود مشروع لمواجهة إيران، إذا مش طبعا إلغاء الاتفاق النووي، إحنا ما أعتقد في أحد طالب بإلغاء الاتفاق النووي، لكن تعديل الاتفاق فيما يخص سلوك إيران، هذه النقطة الرئيسية. إذا ما يكون في مشروع واضح جدا في موضوع مواجهة إيران وانا هنا يعني استخدم عباره عبارات معالي انور القرقاش امس حكى على الموضوع هو تكلم على الكولكتيف افورت لانه هذا عمل جماعي مش عمل فردي مجموعه دول تشتغل عليه مع بعض يكون في جبهه موحده تقريبا من المجموعه وفي مصالح مشتركه الولايات المتحده هي الوحيده القادره على نظم هالسبحه هالمجموعه مجموعه نشاطات وقوانين تشترك فيها عقوبات اقتصادية وعقوبات عسكرية ومواجهات وتحالفات اللي ممكن هي تواجه التمدد الإيراني في حال استمر الاتفاق النووي لا أتوقع حيستمر الاتفاق النووي حتى الآن. I want to follow up with this question with Mr. Abdul Rahman before before I move to you guys. But my question to Mr. Abdul Rahman is going to be this: How can we in the GCC influence American policy in this regard? Mr. Abdul Rahman said that. Uh, you know uh, uh, what we should do in the in the Arab world in the Middle East is identify a single issue English. and go after this issue and explain it to the Americans that this is our number one uh, issue for us is the Ir Iranian threat to the region. And my question to Abdurrahman is going to be: How can we influence the U.S. foreign policy vis-à-vis -vis the Iranian issue? كيف لنا أن نؤثر على أمريكا ونفهم ال 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 الحك الحكومات ال الإدارات المتعاقبة. في امريكا بان هذا هو موضوعنا الرئيسي في المنطقه. يعني ايش اللي في ايدنا؟ انا انا اعتقد يعني الولايات المتحده لها مصالح متعدده يعني من بينها ما ممكن محاربه داعش والجماعات المتطرفه الاخرى اللي هي ايضا في الخط في المعسكر الاخر حزب الله وعصائب الحق والاخرين. 
ما ممكن الولايات المتحدة العراق بالنسبة للولايات المتحدة دولة مهمة واستراتيجية بالنسبة لها ما ممكن يكون في سيطرة على أو تأمين استقرار العراق من دون ما يكون في دفع إيران ورجاعها الوراء ما ممكن يكون في المنطقة هذه سلام مشروع السلام يتكلموا عنه وإعادة إحياء السلام في العربي الإسرائيلي من دون أيضا الضغط على إيران في هالجزئية ما ممكن يكون في في المنطقة يعني زي ما تقول إنه استقرار اللي له علاقة بحركة النفط والنشاط الاقتصادية من دون ما يكون أيضا في قصدي كل ما تلف من كل جهة ترجع لك موضوع إيران فالولايات المتحدة والدول الأخرى ما فيها طبعا روسيا لأن روسيا الآن طرف في المعركة من يوم خرجت رجعت مرة ثانية انه يكون في نوع من التفاهم على انه هذه الجزئيه، هذا الملف الوحيد اللي نعتقد ممكن نحصل فيه الى حد ما اشياء مشتركه بين كل الاطراف المختلفه، حتى في داخل ايران يعني اليوم مع مع تقادم العمر بالنسبه للمرشد الاعلى وفي حال خلافته حنكتشف وحنرى طبعا الحرس الثوري هو اللي يحكم بشكل اكثر مع الوقت وهو اللي بيسيطر على الوضع في داخل ايران، حتى القوى المعتدله في داخل النظام الايراني تحتاج الى هذا المشروع اللي انا اتكلم عنه اللي هو الحقيقه الاخوان حكوا عنه بطرق مختلفه امس ولكن انا سؤالي لك كيف لنا ان نؤثر على السياسه الامريكيه في هذه كيف لنا ان نشرح لهم هل نشتري اسلحه هل نوقع اتفاقيات دفاع مشترك هل نستثمر في شركات في حال شوف ما ممكن هذه كلها نتائج نهائيه الاقناع انه هذا المشروع في, في يصب في المصلحه العليا الولايات المتحده في المنطقه الولايات المتحده عندها النشاطات الاتفاقيات موجودة الأمنية الاتفاقيات مع التريجري ديبارتمنت موجودة ضد إيران وجماعاتها في المنطقة هذه كلها مجموعة منظومة كاملة ممكن يقتنعوا فيها أمريكيين ولكن لابد يكون في المصلحة مشتركة ويكون واضحة يعني إبقاء الاتفاق النووي يتطلب الخط الثاني اللي كل الجميع مشتركين فيه في التكاليف مشتركين فيه وفي النشاطات العرض متفقين عليه شكرا أد أعطيك شانس the translation. So uh, what Abdurrahman Rashid, of course, uh, was, was talking about is uh, the importance of concentrating of the Middle East or the Arab world, maybe the Gulf, finding a single issue, which in our case is the Iranian threat to the region, um, and uh, convincing the U.S. government of how important this issue is uh, to us. But we all, we'd like to ask your opinions. How could we in the Gulf influence American foreign policy to our advantage? What is available for us? that is, you know, uh, legal, that is, uh, you know, available to, to the Gulf states that we can use as tools to influence U.S. foreign policy to make them see our point of view vis-a-vis -vis Iran? Well, first of all, you have sort of a conscience policy of saying that we are back, we America, we the administration are back in the business of listening to our allies and that that is meant to be a change from the Obama era. Don't be a stranger in Washington. Mohammed bin Salman has the best relationship of any Saudi leader, certainly since Bandar, maybe ever. Mm -hmm. You should take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. Trump and the Trump leadership throughout the administration like new channels, they like new people. They don't want to go down the same old roads. The, the UAE has immense respect and goodwill in Washington as a mature, reliable presence. Don't be a stranger. The State Department is still largely unpopulated. There's some reasons for that. The, uh, the Trump administration, the Trump White House wants to be the funnel. They want to direct policy. They want to hear from their allies. So like I said, don't be a stranger. Also, don't overlook the Congress. The Congress is vital. They tend to get overlooked because they're not loud. Uh, the Congress right now is probably more aggressive in terms of writing sanctions directed at Iran, directed at Hezbollah, that the administration usually doesn't want. The presidents usually don't like congressionally mandated sanctions because it thinks it, it infringes and encroaches on their authority to conduct foreign policy, but it's happening, and it's happening quick. Don't overlook Democrats. Democrats in the track two opinion leader, uh, the opinion leader realm, as well as in the Congress. You know, just to, to shift to my forte, American domestic politics, just for a moment. In American politics, what's supposed to happen tends to happen. 
And in midterm elections, the party in power of the White House lose a lot of seats. It always appears to be a unique set of circumstances and candidates and personalities. Just the, always, the, thing, the same thing always seems to happen. It is, if by any measure, historically, and if you took a snapshot today, it's still too early to extrapolate out to the next election, but the Republicans are going to lose at least one House of the Congress. In the real time, at home in America, that doesn't just mean the votes will go a different way. It means the president's political opponents will have institutional authority. They can have subpoenas. They can prioritize. They can say who gets nominated, what gets passed, what goes in a budget with much more authority than they do today. It's also, that's Roman number one, it's also true in the foreign policy realm. You'll see the Democrats want to oppose the president and, and in some cases go their own way with things like sanctions, with military sales, with foreign aid support, with uh, military training, national security alliances, things like that. So in whatever it is, less than one year, it's likely that at least one house will be under, of the Congress will be under Democrat control and, and foreign capital should prepare for that. Uh, I just want to follow up quickly before I, uh, I move to James. What, uh, but, you know, if the Gulf states start cozying up to Democrats, wouldn't this insult Trump? Wouldn't this no. annoy Trump? I, well, no. it doesn't work that way. Everybody expects it. It's baked into the system. Nobody expects people to ignore the obvious. Nobody expects to... I mean, America doesn't. We, we, don't, we don't ignore minority parties and, and things in foreign capitals. So don't do too much, but don't do nothing. <laughs> okay. A deft touch. James, so uh, Ed said that we, sh we should look at uh, uh, dialogue with Congress. Uh, we should look at uh, other means of influencing uh, U.S. foreign policy. What, is, what else is available to us? Well, I actually want to go back, Sultan, to the way you frame the question. And the way you frame the question is along the following lines. What is it that we can do to persuade American foreign policy to take care of our interests? And I'll just say, as an American, what I'm focused on is how to have American foreign policy serve American interests. Okay. And I think that is at the core of America first. Let's go back and look at the campaign. Uh -huh. Donald Trump's meta message to the American public was American foreign policy has not worked for at least a generation. It hasn't worked because our friends and allies have ridden on our coattails and because we've had trade deals that have looted America of its jobs. And the thing now is to put American interest first. And I think that is a message that actually resonates not just with people who voted for Mr. Trump, but also people who don't like Mr. Trump. Moving beyond, and I think on the issue that was raised, uh, this, the issue of should the United States do something about a potential Iran, nuclear Iran, that sale has already been made. You don't need to make it again. I think the real question facing this administration is, what do you do about it? What are the practical, actionable, steps that are likely to work to avoid the outcome that we fear. And the challenge for Washington is that it has to balance not only American interests, not only interests or concerns of people here in the Gulf who are closest to Iran, uh, but also the interests and perspectives of the other great powers. It's a very complicated negotiation. And what I will say is having sat here yesterday and listened to a number of terrific speakers, I must say the last uh, session we had, we talked about Iran, the nature of the threat, and the difficulty of dealing with that threat left me thinking the Trump administration has a very tall order to face. It is a very difficult challenge. And so I think, and I understand the points of talking to people and disseminating information, but I think what's most helpful is generating ideas about how do you counter Iranian influence, how do you roll it back, how do you do so effectively uh, preferably uh, at minimal cost. 
Um, I have some questions uh, from the audience, but uh, should I? I will take a couple of questions from the audience, uh, but I'd like you to keep it very short. Uh, 15 seconds, I will cut you off. فأول أول مداخلة عندي من الأستاذ الدكتور سعد العجمي رجاء تخلي المداخلة قصيرة okay. عشان نسمع من من شكرا الأخ الرئيس 15 seconds not even enough to thank the you know organizers we can skip we can skip the thank okay دكتور ابتسام no thanks to you okay <laughs> um, now I, I wanted to just uh, f uh, make a comment and perhaps focus on an important point. Uh, Two things. One, the relative stability and security, prosperity that our region enjoys is because of the very special relationship with the West, in particular the United States of America. Two, this region's middle name is uncertainty. Its last name is conspiracy. And there is this feeling of distrust of our major ally to sell us out like Obama did in the deal of the five plus one. How do you envisage President Trump's new policy of not being able to abrogate the five plus one agreement, because the fives are there, and focusing on the past Iran, the Revolutionary Guards, who are basically, calling them a terrorist organization, they are basically the regime itself, because they're not just militias, they are the regime. Once the Iranians feel that they are being targeted as a regime, they will duck down for the storm a bit, but then they will come back in full force. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, maybe I can take a second question before I move on to, uh, to the answers. I have a question from uh, Mr. Salman Dosari. Yes, sir, in the front. Sabah al-Khair. Mr. Abdurrahman, you have spoken about three reasons or three reasons that have been affected by the relations of the Saudi Arabia and the American. And in the midst of the struggle or the legal decision of the Saudi Arabia in the time of President Obama, to what extent will the Saudi Arabia say to the American no in the coming period? To what extent will we see differences in the legal decisions of the Saudi Arabia with Washington? Thank you. شكرا ممكن اخذ الاجوبه الان طيب uh, all the questions that, fantastic okay well uh, we have a question from uh, Mr. جمال فخرو i don't know where he's seated شكرا سيد الرئيس سؤالي قصير ومحدد تفضل اذا قال الحديث عن تحالفات لمواجهه ايران ايران عدو لاسرائيل لافتراض ذلك طبعا هل يمكن الدول العربيه ان تتحالف مع اسرائيل لمواجهه ايران اها سؤال رائع طيب آه، ناخذ كمان اسئله عندك سؤال؟ طيب استاذ عبد الله فخر استاذ عبد الله بشاره ما 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 سالت حضرتك ما عندي على سيستم مو مشكله برجع لك بعد شويه برجع لك بعد دقيقه عندي شخص ثاني برجع لك بعد دقيقه طيب الاستاذ علي خشيبان وين قاعد؟ هنا هنا تفضل يسارك مال الشيخ تفضل انا اسف تفضل ماي كويستشن جوز تو دايركتلي تو مستر ايد از يو منشن ذا جود ريليشن شيب بين برنس محمد بن سلمان اند مستر ترامب دو يو ثينك ذير از ان كونسيست ريجاردن تو ذيس ريليشن انسايد ذا يونايتد ستيت بين ذا بنتاغون اند ذا سي اي اي دو يو ثينك ذات ذيس This relationship also goes to uh, those uh, two important components in, in the United States. ممكن نجاوب على الأسئلة شوي لأن الأسئلة وايدة فا بعد إذنك الدكتورة إذا ممكن بس نجاوب على الأسئلة. We have a bunch of questions and I want to just tally them together for you. Um, first of all, we had a question uh, that we had a gentleman who asked, can, uh, shouldn't we or shouldn't the U.S. target the Iranian regime directly? according to the gentleman, because targeting the Iranian Revolutionary Guards is just a single militia within the government. However, it is the government, it is the regime that the Gulf states views as a threat, and not just the IRGC. Uh, a second question was, uh, should, the, should we see a, uh, uh, a time where the, uh, where the Middle Eastern states or the Arab world allies with Israel to counter Iranian uh, threats? 
Finally, uh, another question we had for you specifically, uh, Ed, is, is um, Prince Mohammed bin Salman's relationship with the White House, does it also go uh, to the Pentagon and uh, to other levels in the State Department, or is it only with the White House? And then we had finally a question of a gentleman who asked, can the Gulf states say no to the uh, US? Whoever wants to take a stab, and I can I repeat the question. Jim. Jim. Uh, which question would you like me to answer since <laughs> there are five and I've forgotten what the first four was? With the, well, the, should, the, should the Arab world ally with Israel? Uh, I, I'll skip you the other question, but shouldn't the sanctions target the Iranian regime rather than the IRGC? Uh, actually, let me step back and, and, and answer a broader question. The gentleman over here uh, observed uh, that people in the region were worried about being betrayed by the United States. And I will say, since I had the great pleasure to go to many parts of the world, that's a feeling that many allies have about the United States. If you're in Seoul, South Korea right now, uh, the sort of twin concerns of on the one hand, the United States will embroil you in a war you do not want, and on the other hand, strike a deal with China that will not take into account your interests. So I'm, I'm not sure that uh, the concern that's felt here in the Gulf is only felt in the Gulf, and it's mm -hmm. the nature of uh, alliance relations. Uh, I think in terms of uh, you know, the, the challenge the Trump administration faces is how do you bring pressure to bear on Iran mm -hmm. given that the JCPOA does exist? The United States is not going to walk away uh, from the Iran nuclear deal no matter what happened on October 13th. Uh, the United States, the fact that those exist, and the JCPOA uh, whatever you think of its merits, at the end of the day, bought time. Mm -hmm. And the question though is, has been buying time can be a useful strategy as long as you have an idea of what to do with the time you have purchased. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think, and I, I, uh, I think I'm sympathetic to the point Ed made earlier, that the Obama administration had a clear idea of what to do with that time. Uh, and I think the challenge facing the uh, Trump administration is to figure out precisely how to do that. I'm not so sure that Trump administration will draw the distinction that was in the question between the IRGC and the regime, but rather regarding the IRGC as the regime. Okay. Um, Ed, I have two questions I want you to answer quickly. Okay. Uh, shouldn't the sanctions target the Iranian regime rather than the uh, Revolutionary Guards? And does Prince Mohammed bin Salman have a good relationship with State Department as well as Pentagon, the same way he has with the White House? Well, I'm not sure. That I understand the distinction between the regime and the Revolutionary Guard, you know, that said, there's more sanctions coming. There are sanctions that are going to come from the Congress, whether the administration wants it or not, and I think the administration does want it. So I think that you're going to see more of everything in sanctions, in moving on multiple fronts in an aggressive way to check Iran's corrosive presence in the region. That's going to happen. Uh, specifically about the relationship with uh, Prince Salman throughout the administration. First, in a big picture level, you know, Trump is an independent who got elected as a Republican. His cabinet comes from the, Repu the conservative wing of the Republican Party. Most of them are experienced, savvy political participants that have been in and out of government, that have had previous service, many have run for office. And I say that to make the point that they are comfortable with the U.S. traditional U.S.-Saudi relationship where, the Saudi, the, where, where Saudi Arabia is our anchor ally in the region. So returning to that is easy for this cabinet as you get and the concentric rings away from the White House. On the question of specifically for Prince Salman, it's familiarity that's built over time. He's come to Washington a couple of times. I think he's coming back pretty soon. You're having increasingly both congressional delegations as well as cabinet members visit Saudi Arabia, visit the region for one reason or another. So I think the relationship with the individual leadership and with the G to G relationship, government to government relationship overall, for the first time in eight years, has a tailwind rather than a headwind. Sad Abdurrahman, هناك مجموعة من الأسئلة هل في سؤال محدد تحب ترد عليه؟ 
اعتقد السؤال اللي وجه لي شخصيا اللي هو من الاستاذ سلمان دوسري على موضوع الاشكال القطري في مجلس التعاون في موضوع العلاقه مع الولايات المتحده في اطار موضوع الندوه يعني. وطبعا يعني هذه هذه يبين جزء اساسي من الاشكاليات الموجوده في موضوع التعامل مع القضايا الرئيسيه دائما فيها عوامل صغيره ممكن تعيق الحركه من بينها مثلا موضوع قطر انه انت الان بتقول والله انا بسوي علاقه مع الولايات المتحده واستراتيجيه كبيره جدا في مواجهه التمدد الايراني، بعدين تشوف قطر اللي هي جزء من مجلس التعاون تروح وتلتقي مع حزب الله ويكون بينهم اجنده مشتركه. هنا عندك مشكله رئيسيه انت ما تستطيع الحقيقه تدخل معارك مع دول متعدده وتسمح لدوله معك في الجي سي سي عامله اتفاقيات او تفاهمات او حتى دعم ولو مؤقت مع منظومه نعتبرها ارهابيه مسجله مصنفه ارهابيه زي حزب الله. هذا الاشكال الرئيسي في في الخلاف الخليجي الخليجي او او بشكل عام محاوله السيطره على اوضاع داخل البيت. هل في امكانيه انه ممكن هذه تحل عن طريق العلاقه الكبرى مع الولايات المتحده؟ طبعا انا اعتقد العلاقه الامريكيه ما لها علاقه بالخلاف القطري الرباعي. ولا المفروض تدول القضيه، هذه موضوع داخلي، وانا اعتقد الصراع او او هو هو يعني الجدل الموجود هو قديم جدا ولكن وصل مرحله انه القطيعه موجوده، هي ما فيها عقوبات، عمليا قطيعه بين الطرفين بغض النظر عن كله. هل ممكن انه قطر تاثر على التفاهمات الامريكيه الخليجيه؟ بالتاكيد ممكن تاثر عليها سلبا وهي شغاله تحاول تعمل نوع من النراتيف الخطاب السياسي اللي عندها. الموجه ضد الخطاب السياسي اللي صادر عن السعوديه والامارات والبحرين ومصر. هذه بالتاكيد يسوي نوع من التشويش ونوع من اللخبطه ولكن في النهايه انا اتصور قطر يعني هي رقم صغير في الحسابات المجموعه حقيقه يعني بس انها مزعج يعني مش نعم نعم عندنا خمس دقائق بس فاحب اخذ سؤالين اخرين 15 مينتس <تصفيق> عشان بدينا متاخر طيب في عندنا سؤال من استاذ ظافر العجمي My question is to Mr. Rogers. A couple of months ago, uh, President uh, Trump tweeted that uh, Iran just fired or test fired a missile. It turns out the Republican Guards was showing uh, a missile in, in a parade. So you said he, he was creating a historical phenomenon. To us, he looks like a misinformed president. If he doesn't know that rocket was just in a show instead of, of a test firing. Thank you. Would you repeat the question? It, it's about the, uh, the, uh, the rocket that was fired from... Uh, from Iran. From Iran. They, they, well, not from Iran, from uh, the from, test rocket. From Yemen? From Yemen, right? Or testing their intercontinental ballistic no, no, missiles no, no, capability? Yes. yes. No. It was a parade. No. The, the, he tweeted that Iran just a rocket. The truth was the Republican Revolutionary Guards was showing a rocket in a parade. Nobody fired anything. So if a president doesn't know this simple information, mm. so we are facing a misinformed president. Well, I want to be respectful to my president. <laughs> That said, sometimes he gets tweet facts totally wrong. I had delicately said earlier that in many quarters in Washington, there's no longer an effort to reconcile a tweet in the morning with what's happening later in the day. Again, I have a retention policy of less than 24 hours on any given tweet. I recommend everybody else adopt that policy and tune their brain for that. So I can't really speak to that specific tweet, but the problem of the president tweeting erroneous things is a problem. It is a problem with tax reform. It is a problem with American domestic policy. It is a problem with him picking fights with widows of soldiers, picking fights with governors, picking fights with Democrats, picking fights with the media. It is a huge distraction often laced with things that are incorrect. It is inexplicable to me. And in this case, it causes anxiety, uncertainty, 
in a foreign capital over a consequential matter. Um, we have a I question. don't know what to say, Thank but. you. We have a question from a very patient. You can tell uh, I'm anguished about it. Abdullah Bshara, very patient. Thank you for waiting. Thank you. <clears throat> I am, um, well, I am, uh, I'm a Kuwaiti. Uh, my country was rescued by the United States, by coalition. I tell you frankly, uh, I don't like the sense of complacency in the Gulf, in their laxity over building a second tier of military deterrent. We have the United States, yes, but is there, I want at least a smaller substitute. So in my, uh, my tenure, uh, Secretary General, and, and, uh, and subsequently, the, this laxity, this sense of complacency on military buildup and preparedness is conspicuously absent. I, uh, I thought that uh, the, some, uh, some admonishment, some criticism, some uh, comment by the United States that we are in the, first, in the front line but we want you to be second, and you have to be prepared, and you have to remove this sense of laxity. Thank you, thank you, Salah Abdullah. Shukran. Shukran. This is the so message. We'll move to the next uh, question. We have uh, Oda Aburdi. Uh, uh, I have a question for Jim Lindsay first and to Ed Rogers. The role of think tanks in the US and their impact on U.S. foreign policy. Fantastic question. Okay, role of think tanks. Let's move to the next person, Mr. Hamdan uh, Al Thani. <clears throat> Good morning. Excuse me. I just wanted to ask a question. Why is the U.S. supporting Qatar by selling F-15s, knowing that Qatar is and Iran are both allies? Great question. Okay. Let's move to uh, Mr. Dr. Saeed Lamtawa. Redefining allies and enemies in the foreign policy of the U.S., changing presidents and changing power in the Congress. Shouldn't the foreign policy be fixed on a certain path on redefinition those? Okay, so I didn't uh, know I'll stop here just so that we can answer the questions. Um, so uh, we have a bunch of questions here. Um, one of them is the role of uh, think tanks in, uh, in uh, uh, influencing uh, U.S. Uh, foreign policy. Uh, and maybe this also ties in with Dr. Saeed's question about being, having a long-term foreign policy uh, in the U.S. If, if any of you wants to take a stab at that question. Jim? I'll be happy to take a stab. I'm going to be... Uh, my answer is by definition going to have to be incomplete because they're two great big questions. Uh, let me take uh, Otis' question about think tanks. Think tanks matter in the United States because think tanks are places that ideas are generated, assessed, and disseminated. Now, I note that after uh, the election last year, uh, there was a widely read article uh, that talked about the death of think tanks because the election of Donald Trump signified the death of expertise. And so I think tanks were the home of experts, and if experts, expertise had died, so must uh, the homes that host them. I found that to be anything but the case. Uh, I think what's quite clear is that foreign policy matters, that President Trump, for well or for ill, is raising first order questions about American foreign policy. That has greatly increased interest. Uh, so where I work at the Council on Foreign Relations uh, and the think tank that I oversee, we're actually spending more time up on the Hill uh, doing briefings, being asked to do that. Uh, we also spend a fair amount of time with administration officials. Yes, the Trump administration officials do want to go out and get the best analysis from people out there. So I think uh, you know, the role that think tanks play is they can help generate information. Uh, and steer the debate. I just want to dive in a little bit more into the role of think tanks. So you're telling us that uh, U.S. Uh, governments or U.S. administrations or perhaps even U.S. presidents would uh, read a recommendation from a think tank and this would influence their foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the region? 
Oh, I want to be very careful. I, I am not suggesting, though I might hope, uh, that President Trump will sit down at night and pick up a council special report and read it carefully. I don't think that's ever really been uh, the way that think tanks uh, operate. Uh, I think think tanks operate by injecting ideas out into, into the world of discussion. I mean, in, 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 think, for example, Ed. Ed writes a fairly regular column for the Washington Post, which is about uh, throwing ideas out there into the conversation. It's very difficult to measure how ideas float and where they go to. Uh, but obviously, you know, the government, whether you're thinking the administration, you're thinking Capitol Hill, also want information. They want ideas. Mm -hmm. And they do turn to think tanks. I'm not in any way suggesting that think tanks are the only force uh, in American foreign policy, but they are a significant player, and they continue to be so even in the era of Donald Trump. Um, yeah, I, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say the think tanks disproportionately, not a majority, but a plurality, populate the media, populate the government, supply the forums where former government officials, opinion leaders, and commercial interest intermingle. It's pretty unique. And obviously, think tanks are going through a transition like everybody else. A lot of think tanks in Washington geared up for President Hillary Clinton. And so some retooling has taken place and is taking place. Uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, I think, is I'm a member, and it has been probably, it's probably the most distinguished, the most formidable think tank in America, and it's done a good job of maintaining balance. Some think tanks got out of balance, and they're less in demand right now, no secret. But again, it is the think tanks that still populate the media, populate a lot of the government. Think tanker just became the Assistant Secretary of State for Europe, and again, they uniquely provide a business and academic intellectual commingling that doesn't exist anywhere else. One and that matters I, a lot in the Trump administration. If I may just sort of build on what uh, Ed just said, one of the major functions of think tanks is their convening power. Just what we've done here, Dr. Epstein, with the Emirate Policy Center, bringing people together who have ideas, thoughts, and views and getting a conversation going. That's one of the major ways in which think tanks of all stripes inject ideas into the body politic by bringing people who have ideas together uh, in the pursuit of a civil discourse uh, questioning big ideas. Um, there was a gentleman who asked a question about why the uh, U.S. is selling uh, um, military uh, jets, uh, F-15s to, to Qatar when it is uh, allied with, uh, with Iran and doesn't that, uh, again, send mixed signals? Um, if anybody wants to answer that, if Ed, if you want to answer that. Well, I don't think that a lot of, particularly the uniform military in the U.S., are ready to throw in the towel and confirm the, the presumption that Qatar is allied with Iraq and that somehow those Iran. jets yeah. in, in Iran and those jets would somehow become an asset of an Iranian interest. I don't think the uniform military is there. Speaking of coming to Washington, I don't think there's 10 members of Congress that have any idea what the dispute is about beyond some headlines between the GCC and Qatar. There's a lot more discussion education and all of these take place in Washington about what it's about and what's a desirable outcome. And the uniform military has such a history and such a presence in Qatar, they have to be part of the, part of the discussion. Very well. Set up the, go ahead, James. Well, I, what I would add to it, I think it extends beyond the issue of the U.S. military. Obviously, the U.S. military has a, a major stake given the uh, U.S. air base uh, in Qatar. I would say extending it to the broader American think tank community, I don't think sees uh, Iran or as a uh, ally of Qatar or vice versa. And I think it's important to keep in mind this, I think this issue signifies that for the friendship between the UAE and the United States or Saudi Arabia in the United States, uh, our interests and how we define our interests uh, or our friendships aren't identical, uh, and it is possible to have disagreements even among friends, and I think that is the case here. 
I'm asking in Arabic now. Sad Abd Rahman, a group of questions, among them the role of think tanks, the political theory in America, among them the political buying of weapons to some countries that may have relationships with other countries. So, I'd like to hear your opinion. إد حكى على موضوع المبيعات إد is familiar with Congress corridors and the ممرات of Congress يعرف الناس اللي هناك لكن بالنسبة للسياسة الأمريكية طبعا أمريكا في التعامل مع المجموعة الخليجية بشكل عام كلهم حلفة بالنسبة لها قطر السعودية الأمارات عمان البحرين مصر طبعا حتى خارج المجلس ففي خلاف في داخل مجموعة الحلفاء فهي بطبيعة الحال تحاول تمسك العصا في النص تبيع لهذا F-15 وتبيع لهذا الصواريخ وتعطي هذا طبيعي ولكن الإشارات السياسية في العملية ذي كلها مهمة جدا أنه وين ننتقل من عملية المبيعات الأسلحة إلى مشروع السياسي مش مبيعات الأسلحة المشروع السياسي الحقيقة يكون في تفاهمات على حتى وجود خلافات أنه هذه الأسلحة تستخدم في إطارات في إطار معين في ظل الكلام على وجود الدرع الصاروخي مثلا اللي كان مطروح سابقا لحمايه الخليج من التهديدات الصاروخيه، الايرانيين عندهم التفوق الـ 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 الارضي عندهم طبعا الصواريخ ايضا البلاستيك ميسايل يعني ادفانسمنت اللي 800 كيلو ضاربين من من اليمن الى حد مدينه الرياض. فالبلاستيك ميسايل طبعا بروجرام هو قضيه مهمه بالنسبه لدول الخليج كونها مباشره باتجاه ايران. هذا يرجع الموضوع الدرع الصاروخي، انا بتكلم من الناحيه السياسيه مش من الناحيه العسكريه. بدون وجود التفاهم على وجود هذا المشروع العسكري السياسي المشترك، الدول الخليج في حاله طبعا يعني وضعه يكون صعب جدا. وارجع مره ثانيه بدون ايضا ترتيب البيت الخليجي والضغط على قطر وتغيير سياساتها، حيكون التعامل في هذا الموضوع تحديدا صعب جدا. بس لو لو يعني في امريكا مثلا كان في اتجاه نحو انشاء درع دفاعي موحد في الخليج ولكن هذا الموضوع يمكن الان غير وارد فهل هل هل ننشئ درع دفاعي واحد من غير قطر مثلا او تشوف يعني امس كان في ندوه مهمه جدا وحكى فيها الاخوان على موضوع مستقبل الجي سي سي وتكلم فيها معالي الاستاذ عبد الله على موضوع انه الجي سي سي بني في الاساس على شكلا هو على على مشروع اقتصادي بس هو كان بني الحقيقه مثل التعاون في مواجهه ايران بعد عام 79 والثوره الايرانيه وليس المشروع الاقتصادي مثل التعاون عباره عن مشروع امني عسكري في الاصل حقيقه يعني والان بوجود الخلاف الداخلي خلاف كبير جدا ممكن يتفكك مثل التعاون وممكن ينتهي مثل التعاون يكون في فورميشن مختلفة جديدة، طبعا ما حد يتمنى هالوضع لأنه الوضع الحالي حتى كل مجموعة الدول الست في داخل مجلس التعاون تشتغل على أقل قدر ممكن من البطارية الضعيفة عشان ما يكون في اشتباكات في داخل المجلس، لا يزال القطريين يشتغلون في مدينة الرياض رغم القطريين ممنوع ممنوعين من دخول السعودية، أعضاء مجلس التعاون في صحوني أعضاء إذا في أحد مجلس التعاون إذا أنا غلطان في المعلومة لا يزالوا موجودين في داخل المقر الرئيسي في الرياض يشتغلون فواضح انه مس الدول الست كلها بتحاول تحافظ على هالكيان الموجود لانه كيان يعني بني على فتره طويله ولكن في اطار الحديث العلاقه الولايات المتحده المجلس التعاون اقيم جزء من العلاقه الخليجيه الامريكيه ككيان مشترك طيب هذه اهميته يعني طيب وصلنا الى نهايه الجلسه اريد اشكر الاستاذ اد روجرز والاستاذ جيمس لينزي والاستاذ عبد الرحمن الراشد شكرا لكم شكرا للاسئله شكرا, شكرا.